Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me for another of my wonderful interviews. An interval, interval, an interview where I'm out and about. I've crossed out of Sussex where I live and I've come to West Suffolk to meet up with Mark Byford. Hello, Mark. The Richard. bowler hatted farmer. And there it is, the bowler hat itself. Um, I felt it's now necessary for me, as I've said in previous interviews now, is to get out of the studio and actually get on the land, particularly with the farming stuff. Yep. Because unless you do, you don't really get an idea of the scale of not only the problem, but farms and the d different types of farms and the yep. different types of farmers. Yep. Now, Mark has been on the show before, but we had a, a Zoom we chat. We did. Here we are sitting by this beautiful 1940... Yeah, I think this one's a 1954 um, Ferguson. Little grey Fergie. And lovely, lovely, yeah, beautiful. beautiful thing. And there's a lots of other um, bits of um, memorabilia from old farms, as it were. But that, are they all working? Yeah, nearly everything, yeah. Including a steam engine. Including the steam engine in the background. And a, and yeah. a thrashing machine that we saw in there. It all works. And it all works, that's um, incredible. And that is very much, actually, it's quite interesting that we're sitting here with what some people might say, well, they're just museum pieces. Farming's not like that anymore. Yeah. Farming has grown, hasn't it? It's, it's kind of grown so big that the farmers that do the farming seem to have lost the fact that they're growing food. Absolutely. And they're, not, they're no longer connected to the soil. I agree, 100%. I mean, we talk about the steam engine to start with, my grandfather, when he had the farm up the road, they had 16 sets of big steam engines and thrashing machines, what they used to take around farm to farm through the summer. And they would use steel cable ploughing um, ploughs through the winter to turn the soil and so forth. And that's what they did um, as agricultural contractors. And it was all very much about being hands-on. And you look now and you know, you're sitting a big tractor, you're, you know, you're five foot off the ground and, you know, you put your piece of equipment on the back, what's got to do whatever you've got to do, whether it's a plough or whatever, you don't need to get out of the tractor. There's no connection with the soil. This is my, you know, my opinion. I still like to get a fork and get physically in the, in the soil to plant things. But everything's done by equipment and machinery and robotics, definitely, as, as we move forward. That's something that's going to take over, I think, on the food um, service side. And, you know, I think... It's concerning for me, as someone who likes to get my hands dirty, uh, just how detached we are now from food as a whole, not just, yes. not just the land, food as a whole. Yeah, and, and I mean, just to follow on your story, Julia and I were heading somewhere the other day, we pulled into a petrol station and Julia said, oh, you see that young lad over there, and he was in his 20s, clean as a whistle, you know, looked like he'd just got out and got to work. She says, she just got out of that tractor. And we looked at the tractor, massive, great big tractor. And you could see this guy probably never touched the soil. Um, and that was really sad. Yeah. And I think this has come about in the last, I think, the last 20, 30 years, you know, especially from the farming community as well as the public, that detachment. And I think one thing I've seen in the, for the farmers that have a lot of livestock, especially, it's now about the, the chase of the commercialism. We must get these pigs to wait to get them to slaughter. We must get them out to, because the next lot are coming in. And a lot of these farms now, Richard, they only do bed and breakfast. So they don't actually own the pigs. The pigs right. are owned by somebody else. So they physically come in as piglets. They're dropped off at a few weeks old. They're then fed for 12 weeks. And at 12, after they've had 12 weeks of worth of that food, they're at the right weight exactly to go to slaughter. So the farmers have got no attachment anymore where, you know, when we've had pigs, I knew the name of all the pigs. You could give them a scratch behind the ear and, and that, you know, that was, yeah. that was part of that. Um, and you knew when you came to slaughter that and you could eat it and you knew that meat was exactly what, how you'd bred it. That's gone. Mm. The detachment now is so severe, in my opinion, that the, um, you know, we don't care what we give the animal. Um, in regards to food or antibiotics because we don't see it as a piece of meat anymore. We don't see it as a, as a product. It's just a commodity. Right. You know, in the farming community. I mean, I've got a friend who, um, he, he's a big potato and onion grower, and he says to me, he said, oh, we don't grow anything. We just, oh, we just mine for potatoes. 
Um, and that just, for me, summed it up. You know, when he said yes. it, he said it as a joke, and I thought, wow, that's 100% right. Yeah. So, you know, and that, that it's those things what concern me because, you know, I, you know, I'm a dad, I'm a granddad, you know, and I kind of think to myself, when I see the implications of where the food industry has been squeezed and how it's been squeezed from every angle possible, um, where's the food going to come from in a few years' time? And we are, we are only talking about a few years. I would even say we're down to six months to a year we're going to see food shortages. A couple of the things which have come to play, you know, the potatoes that should be in the ground now, only 16% at this point of the potatoes that should be set are set. All the, um, the wheat, what was planted over the winter, has more or less rotted off in the ground. You know, you'll see lots of fields as you, fields as you drive around where the, the headlands of the fields are completely bare. There'll be a little bit in the middle, and that's just because the grain's rotted off in the ground. And that's because we've had so much rain, which we, you know, those can people question. <laughs> who know when they've looked up and, and can count on their hand, hands this year how many days of sunshine we've had. Free. Yeah, <laughs> three. And how many days of rain? Yeah. You know, and, and, and if that's not obvious to people, that there's something, you know, it just, even if you don't believe anything, it's just like, it's the same type of cloud. It's identical cloud. It's not as if the cloud is, is different and you could see it blow in. It's just a blanket and it's yeah. there all day. Well, when we were kids, you know, when you think about, I'm 56, you know, you think back now and you think to yourself, mm. when we were kids, you were in the position that you would get a lovely big fluffy cloud and you could look at the clouds and go, you could play the game of what the cloud was. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, you know, is the cloud, uh, you know, a cow? Or is, is it an aeroplane? You know, whatever it might, might look like, we could say it and was. And it's morphing as it goes yeah. across the sky. Um, now it's just grey. It's just grey. And I think that, you know, when you think about the human psyche and how much we, if, you know, if you play with the ground and you're into soil and so forth, the sky is also part of that, that whole numbing you down. You know, you don't get that sunshine into your body, you don't feel yeah. good about yourself, you know, you, you know, by now we'd be out on the fields, we'd be setting and sowing and whatever else, um, and that isn't happening. Well, ordinarily, I would have done this interview outside, you know, by some stuff that's growing yeah. because we're, we're coming into spring. You can see some of the blossoms on the trees are yeah. coming. It would have looked beautiful. But because it's cold, because it's overcast, and, and this is, I mean, people have got to face this, really. This is the <laughs> silent war that we're in. And it is a battle. And as you mentioned, you know, if your grain is rotting, it's not going to be harvest. Yeah. If it's not harvest, it's not going to be turned into food. And if it's not turned into food, people are going to go hungry. And I think on the other side of that, Richard, people will riot when they get hungry. Um, don't, don't endorse it, but on the other side of it, that people will kick up. And I think we're not a million miles from that. They say we're only you know, three, mile, uh, three miles away from anarchy. And I would say we're not even three miles away now. You know, when... I was having a conversation with someone the other day who's a friend of mine's a, a Tesco's manager at a very high level. And he said to me that pre-pandemic, the, the stores held enough food to last a period. So they now hold 67% less stock than they did pre-pandemic. So pre-pandemic, when the supermarket started to run out of food, there was about a three-day window well, if we're 67% less food, we're not even going to get to four o'clock. No. <laughs> right? No. So, and then you're going to notice there's a problem. And last time there was food in the supply chain. So I'll give you an example. Our farm shop, what we had on our other farm, was we had a small shop that did 10 vegetable baskets every week for local people. And the shop took £100 a day. Pandemic came along and we took... £15,000 a day in the farm shop wow. and sold 400 vegetable boxes a day, right? Now, we could adjust like that, obviously because of my background with the fruit and veg wholesale side, we could adapt really, really quickly to be able to supply that amount of produce. If that happens again, we cannot. Because there's nothing... There's nothing there. There's nothing in the system. So, for instance, the stuff what used to come in from Holland, we'd have Arctic loads trailing in every day. And you could always make a phone call and by the next day it was on your doorstep from Holland. That isn't the case anymore. So it takes far too long to get food into the country. What you want isn't available anyway. And 
so you, you look at all these things and you think to yourself, you know, we, we all know how the Dutch farmers a couple, you know, they're now a couple of years ago were being smashed to shreds. Um, we're now seeing that the farmers are on strike all over Europe. And as a result of that, that's narrowing the window of food down anyway. On top of that, we've got 49% of the food that we eat in the UK we produce in the UK. And by 2030, they're saying we won't have any imported food. Right. So if we're not going to have any food, that says that we're going to lose 51% of the food. And bear in mind at this point, it's 49% on production of last year. There's 2,000 farmers this year have already took the get out of farming um, payment. Right. So if you then look at the other side of that and say, okay, well, there's 2,000 farmers have taken the money to physically get out of farming. That land's lost. You've then got all the farmers that are taking all these subsidies to grow pretty flowers and lovely trees and so forth um, under the new net zero initiatives. What's that 49% of food going to drop to in over the next five years? Yes. And once you get down to that point, you've got to there, you then ask the question, well, what will we live on? Exactly. If we can't import any food yeah. and we're not in the position that we can grow any food, I think there's going to be some hungry people. And that worries me. Oh, well, I should think it ought to worry everyone. Y yeah, you, uh, you, you know. think so. Um, and, and farmers themselves, and this is quite a strange thing, that the farmers themselves <laughs> from... Julia and I went to Groundswell last year, which is a farming... Mm -hmm. They called it a farming exhibition, I think, rather than yeah. a farming yeah. show. And the amount of net zero policy in which they were sequesting that you could do this to get round it and you had to do this with your land and all this sort of capture, carbon capture mm -hmm. stuff was quite shocking when you're walking around and all these people are going, oh yeah, but we still want to sell you this and we sell you this yeah, and you're yeah. thinking, but you're never going to use it, are you? Because you're not actually farming. Um, but then we had a couple of people come up to us, younger people who were, well, they probably didn't have farms, but they may have been sure. very small-scale farmers. They, they, we know the rubbish that's coming down the line. We mm -hmm. know about this. And these farmers don't... They just can't see it because they've, they've swallowed everything the government has, has put to them. And I think you said it. But farmers of that age, yeah. they've grown up to understand that mainstream media is reliable and uh, the government is there to support them and they've taken subsidies and they've believed in all yeah. of this and it's very difficult now to change an old dog's tricks yeah i think we have a big issue at the moment is defra um, and the power that defra has over the funding um, so they're making everybody jump through hoops and bend over backwards to get the funding um, where really in my opinion if a lot of these farmers took the monocrop that they used to deal in with, um, whether that's sugar beet or wheat, whatever, in, you know, in East Anglia, and said, OK, let's grow 15 different varieties of vegetables, for instance. They could then ascertain a lot more money in, of income for the farm, and they wouldn't need as much on the subsidy side. There has to be a point where the food needs to be worth the trouble to grow it. Right. And, and that's where the subsidies always came in. So it, it propped up the... The cheap food scenario at the supermarket checkout, but that's now gone. Supermarkets are charging a fortune. The farmers are getting screwed more and more and more, and all the subsidies is getting swallowed up by the supermarket. Yeah, it's not in the hands of the farmers anymore. No. So that's that's where the challenge sits. Now it's interesting because I've been reading a lot of old farmers' books, old farming books, and AJ AG Street um, was very big at the time, just before yeah. the first world, second world war. Uh, was farming all his life. And at the end of the war, I've got a book, and I'm going to show you some bits later on um, off camera. Um, uh, but he was talking, he's talking about his worry as the war was coming to an end about these subsidies mm -hmm. because he was adamant that farmers ought to be able to be treated the same as any other industry yeah. and not have any special... Um, as if they were a charity, yeah, you know, yeah. because you were looked down on. Yeah. You were suddenly, you know, subservient because you needed this help. But if he's, he was arguing that, well, if we have a subsidy, every industry should have the subsidy. Sure. So we're all treated the same. His other um, axiom, as he called it, was that whatever you do with farmland, you should never 
destroy it, get rid of it. it you've got the land comes first, yeah. and you've got to look after it because you're a custodian for future Absolutely. generations. Um, we seem to, on both those sides, have pushed that away. Uh, yeah. We're ruining the landscape. We're poisoning it very much so. And um, how are you doing? Yeah, we're doing very, very well. Sorry. The gentleman <laughs> just strolling through, but don't right. don't worry. <laughs> um, so we're ruining that on, on all those sides. But I feel that we're at a very important time now that we can relook at how farming is, has been done over the last 80 years since the war. Yep. And those old techniques of mixed farming bring that back. And yes. talking to another dairy farmer that I did on the channel, he was saying that's absolutely essential. Yeah. I, I agree. I think the problem is we need, we need to get back to mixed farming. We need to get farms to understand, especially for things like fertilizers, um, that we can use the natural side by having animals we can produce for, um, um, manure that can be used. I mean, if you go back pre-manure times, my grandfather always used to have these massive great big tanks, what they used to fill of stinging nettles and comfrey leaves. Oh, right. And they used to soak that in water, and that was what they used as fertiliser. So they made a liquid fertiliser, which is high nitrogen based. Right. Um, from stinging nettles and comfrey leaves. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> you know, we use weed killer to kill them off. Yeah. <laughs> no, you should uh, be picking them. And then you're the yeah, land yeah, in the you, process. You should be using that and embracing that to make the fertiliser That is need. brilliant. Um, so I think that there's this whole, to step forward, we have to step back. Yes. And we have to probably step back, I, I would say, 70 to 80 years in the farming side. Get pre-chemicals, dump all the pharmaceutical side of everything in life, you know, from my side, I would say. But, you know, the, the chemical side has taken over um, the natural side of things. So there's lots and lots of things. I'm a... Um, coordinate with the land workers lives as well Richard and for me I go around a lot of the small independent farmers and they're making their own fertiliser making their own compost they're you know they're making sure that they used um, wood chip on the ground to keep the the, um, uh, the weeds suppressed and things and that isn't possible on a commercial farm no so there has to be a, a, a step over point from farming as we have it at the moment to what needs to be, okay? And that might take be a 10 year transitional period. The concern from most of the farmers I speak to is that they do not believe it is possible to grow the amount of food we need for the country without the use of nitrogen based fertilizers. Right. And I do. Yeah. I see some of these farmers and growers through the, through the LWA that are producing vast amounts of food on a very small acreage because the soil is fertile. Yes. And that's where we need to get to. So we need to encourage bigger farmers to get back onto that, get animals back out on the land to naturally fertilize the land and deal. Because if you put pigs on a piece of land, they deal with the weeds because they'll eat everything inside. Yeah. And they'll deal with the, um, on the other side that they'll fertilize the ground for you. So there has to be, you know, we need to get this step over. Obviously that's going to become an issue as we roll forward to 2030. We know because mm. they have an agenda in place to reduce the amount of meat. Um, I don't, by the way, I, I don't buy into that. I think we would have pushed I back, I, you know, I, I, I mean, that <laughs> might be their agenda, but I think common sense and uh, survival instinct is going to come in and say, no, thank you very much. I agree. But, but it's assume, definitely not on my scenario. No, it's not happening on my account. <laughs> I think too many people will be, you, you know, once you start going down that road. And, and you can even see some of the push towards the veganism and the, and yes. the vegetarian. And not that I have anyone, anything against no. anybody who wishes to make that choice. But it should be a choice rather than mandated on you. Yeah, I think this is the problem, isn't it? I think that over the course of the last few years, because you couldn't speak out openly about yes. anything in life, you know, you couldn't just take the piss out of anybody anymore. Um, you know, 20 years ago, if someone had told you they were vegan, they'd have got the backside ripped out of them. Absolutely. And, you know, so now we've got to ad address all of those things. You know, we've, we've got to get people back on the land. We've got to get them naturally growing. Um, and we've got to get the, the community, I think the community as well, because uh, you're a similar sort of age to me, Richard. And in our lifetime, we've gone from having the village playground um, where everybody in the village got involved in everything that happened at the community centre, yes. the village hall, whatever that was classed as. 
Um, there was ITSA knockouts, there was, you know, dance tournaments, whatever it was that was all going on in the community. We no longer have communities mm. and that needs to be put back into play. And I think one of the greatest ways we can achieve that is getting people working together on the land, producing food for themselves and other people around them. Um, I interestingly did the talk the other night and one of the things that came out of that was um, at the end of the meeting, there were several farmers there and I was talking about, well, what's the possibility of some of these farmers giving up a small acreage of land and the community taking it over and growing food for the community? And by the time I got to the end of the talk, several of the farmers said, well, that's actually something we'd be interested in because they foresee the challenges because by the time I got to the end of the talk and spoken about all the net zero policies and everything that was in place, they could then see, well, actually, who's going to grow the food? Yeah. And it's not until they think they're the only farmer who's doing this. And it's not until you say, well, actually, 2,000 farmers have already taken the payment to come completely out of farming. Yeah. Completely. Lock, stock and barrel. Just retire and get out of farming. And, and how many farms do, do we know? How many? 105,000 farms in the UK. So two, you know, you can say basically 2% yeah. is already gone in one year. Yeah. Um, and then look at all the thousands of farmers that are signing up for the subsidies under the Elms programme um, to grow pretty flowers or trees yeah. rather than food of any description, whether that's a grain, sugar beet, um, for you know, for sugar, whether it's potatoes or vegetables, whatever it might be, you're looking at it as a whole, there's thousands upon thousands of acres coming out of agricultural land is disappearing. On top of, under the Green Initiative, we've got fields upon fields upon fields going down to solar panels. Yeah, uh, gosh, and, and, and we one, see them as we drive around. Yeah. So let me put this to, to you as a, as a thought, because it, it dawned on me, what, driving around and you see these monoculture fields, that, that a certain percentage, and I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't be able to hazard to guess what it was, but a large percentage, I would, has, I would think, must be going towards highly processed foods. Yes. And, 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 of course, in supermarkets as a result of that. If you were able to persuade people to not buy from supermarkets for their own health for no other reason other than it makes them healthy and keeps them out of GP surgeries, um, and it's good for their kids and, and possibly things that they may have had injected into mm -hmm. them and what have you. Um, if you could do that, you wouldn't need so much of that monoculture growing that highly processed foods, yep. which would open up a hell of a lot more land yep. to growing the more healthy stuff. Yeah. I was having a conversation the other day with Catherine from the People's Food and Farming Alliance and one of the conversations which has come out of that is a new campaign which we're about to launch which is for the more farmers, more food. And that is about taking small pockets of land from big commercial farms and taking them and converting those into commercial vegetable growing areas that the community runs. So the farmer doesn't necessarily need to be involved. The farmer might have a shed where they can sell the produce through. So it might be that I, and I do think this will happen over the forthcoming. So at the moment we have supermarkets that control most of our food. Let's swap the name supermarket for food hub and let's take out the big farmers and make lots of small farmers. The small farmers supply the food hub and the food hub supplies the public. We only need to take a very small percentage of that over to top the balance on the supermarkets. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think the campaign for the PFFA and different people working together, people like the Land Workers Alliance, they've got 3,000 small independent farms, um, which are all grown um, produce. You know, there's lots of these across the country where people are running CSA schemes, community supported agriculture, veg box schemes. All these things are going on in the background. And all of these people are fairly awake to what's really going on. So if we get all these people back on the land and get them farming locally and within the uh, local community, creating community-based interest again, and get that food naturally grown so people are feeling healthier in themselves as well, because this is one of the problems, obviously, with the supermarket junk, yes. is that it pulls the immune system down. You know, So if you're outside more and having a better quality of food, everyone's going to feel much better. Because obviously... We've been slowly driven down this road over the course yes. of the last 50 years. People don't realise how poorly they feel now no. against how they would have felt if they 50 years ago were alive. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges is that 
because this has been very cleverly and very sneakily put into place, um, that we now need to get that back out into the open and get people back on the land and back out producing food and getting to know their food again and getting to know... You know and the fun. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is, I mean, you, you know, because I think people just think it's very boring because they'll see a tractor, a solo person, as we said, you know, completely devoid yeah. of them. You're not seeing that sense of fun when people are working together, they're having a laugh and then afterwards they're down the pub or they're having a celebration of barbecue or whatever it is, or they're just sharing problems and, they, and they've grown something and, they, and they're proud. Absolutely. This is one of the biggest things we see on the farms with, you know, if you've gone to care farms and things where children are involved, that's one of the things you used to see the most on our other site was the fact that the kids would come there and they would, so they would be involved in sowing the seeds. Let's say run a bean for yeah. instance. They'd be involved. They'd be, be involved in putting the canes up, the, the strings on, winding them up right, right the way through to picking it. And then when they took them home, when they left, you know, three months later with some runner beans, and they were like, "Wow, I did this." They'd go home and you know, explain to mum and dad, "Like I grew these. I did this." Yeah. You know that self worth. Yes. And, you know, and that's one of the things, education now, I've got a nine-year-old and, you know, what they teach them at school now is just frightening. Yeah. And there's, you know... You see, you need your nine-year-old working for you. Yeah, Not when I say working, yeah. but joining and learning. Yeah, just as, absolutely. Just by osmosis and enjoying it. But these days, they're all computer based Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know we have the same, same issue. I've got <laughs> grandchildren and they're getting onto it. Julia has her son who's onto it. And this is... But once these hubs become more popular and yeah. they're around i think it will tease people away from the screen I, I do and i think the other side of the hubs i think as they set up and get moving more farmers will then possibly look at it as an option yes because at the moment they're going oh my god i haven't got an option all i've got is the ability to grow large amounts which goes even into a processors or into a supermarket that's the end of it they don't know where to go after that and i think if they could see that these hubs are available and working, yes. and people are buying the produce that other farmers are supplying, then I think that would escalate quite quickly. And they may, sorry to butt in, they may understand why they got into farming in the first place. Because yeah. you do feel, if they're just filming, if they're just mining potatoes, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you know, that sort of sense of caring for the land, growing something that people will enjoy and pat you on the back and say, oh, you know, your potatoes are the best in the area. You know, they don't get that. Yeah. They may as well be screwing lids on jam jars. Well, it's, it's interesting because the friend who sent me a message the other day, the one who said about mining, sent me a message the other day, and he was saying that under growing terms, they grow potatoes and onions, they can earn bang on £750 per hectare per year, the profit out of growing potatoes. It's £850 for growing pretty flowers and um, trees. So they're being physically paid more by the government not to produce food. Well, that is a suicide mission if yeah. ever there was one. Um, so, you know, and you kind of look at all these things, you say, that's just one example of the kind of the, the nonsense and nastiness that's been put upon us as the, you know, the public. Yeah, it's, it's worrying. So to finish our um, interview on an upbeat note, Absolutely. On an upbeat note, because that's what we've got to do. And I do feel, actually, we're going in this sort of trough yep. of, of doom and gloom, but there are plenty of people who can see the bigger picture down the line, yes. and I feel you're one of them, yeah. because you wouldn't be doing what you're doing yeah. otherwise. That, I, that actually, although it's going to be bumpy, yep. and although it's going to be... What we get out of this, at the end of it, uh, you know, having pushed back the... WEF policy and the, and the government's nonsense <laughs> is, is a country and hopefully countries around the world who have started to understand the most important things in life, which is obviously food being <laughs> food, one of them, yeah. clean water, clean yeah. air. Yeah. And, and I think they can't take us much further down I'd the agree. thing. And, and the only way is up. Yeah, I think... What's reassuring from my side, as I say, with the LWA, 3,000 members growing good quality food. And there's thousands more than that, but they're just the ones that have registered. Um, you know, and if you look at the, the work from um, the PFFA and loads of other organisations like that, um, you look at it all and you think, well, there's a lot of people out there are guiding this in the right direction for food. 
um, you know, whether it's people like myself who do growing, you know, to other farmers that are getting involved in that style of growing, um, that's a massive amount of people, tens of thousands of people that are behind the campaign yes. for better food. And that's where we need to get to. And once people start to have shortages on food, they'll suddenly realise, you know, it's, it's not until it hurt, hits them personally, they'll yeah. suddenly realise, actually, this thing we've taken for granted that's always on a supermarket <laughs> shelf is the most critical thing in our lives. Yeah, um, I would probably be one of the first ones to say, I actually think if we had some shortages, um, would do us good because it would wake the public up. And that's the biggest thing that you've, with yeah. your channel, have tried, me with mine, you know, I, I, if I go and do presentations, anything at all, it's always about trying to wake people up to the next level. And that will be accomplished really quickly. Yes. If the food runs out. Yes. <laughs> you know, if it ran out for just two or three days, people would go <gasps> and yeah. take that, that shock factor would be there. And, and I think at the moment we haven't got that. No. Um, people still believe that they can rock up at Tesco's and everything's going to be on the shelf. You know, I've been to Sainsbury's and it's all there. Yeah. I don't have to worry. Um, the fact that, you know, in five years' time it will be made out of jellyfish or bugs doesn't come to play. No. Because they don't want to believe it. And they probably wouldn't even know because they're so used to the colourings and the flavourings and all of the other stuff. <laughs> They've forgotten what food tastes like. Mark, thank you so much for inviting Richard. me up. It's been fantastic. I know we're As going ever. to do some other bits and bobs, but uh, for now... Um, thank you also to the audience for joining us here in West Suffolk. West Suffolk. Um, on an overcast day. It was overcast when we left down in Sussex. It's no different wherever you go, but we will soon have sunshine and good food. Of that, I'm absolutely convinced. 100%. Till next time, thanks for watching. Goodbye.